similar to John and Mary, Liz and I are also team teaching, just not today, um, because we, yeah, we, we want to respect your time. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll be good with that. I also want to make sure you all get papers. But yeah, so today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the wills of God as well as kind of just look at uh, chapter 7 and this 144,000 and see if y'all are noticing some of the differences here. Um, just because we, we want to make sure we're all good and in the same place um, with that, because uh, that can be a pretty scary number for folks if we don't understand, again, the code of what is going on and what's happening here. Um, but we're going. Does everybody have a paper? No. They're behind you. Anybody else? Cool, yeah, and I am not, I think I've said in the message before, I'm not a handout maker, um, I know my wife is, uh, and yet, I ended up making this handout, so I'll tell you right now, yeah, it's all about me, that's what it is, um, but yeah, so like I said, we're going to take a look at seven, but first I want to talk to you about the wills of God, and the reason I want to talk to you about the wills of God is because as we're looking at these three separate camera angles of the same moment, all right, it'd be really easy to get sucked into the idea of God is just a 12-year-old boy blowing stuff up in the sandbox, okay? Because as we look at this, it's like, man, why is God being kind of a jerk right now? You know, why is he doing this? Why is he acting this way? What is, what's going on? Aren't we good enough? No. <laughs> but it's to understand the wills of God, which are some of the first three things that he reveals to us in his word. Okay, so you don't need to flip over to, to uh, Genesis at all. I'm just going to kind of walk you through what they are. The three categories that we have, first one is God's intended will. Okay, And the intended will is outlined for us in Genesis chapter 1. The intended will of God is best understood from the perspective of a parent with a child. Actually, all the wills of God are understood that way. Okay, The intended will of God. Imagine you have a baby. Okay, Cup your hands, look at your hands. Yes, imagine you have a baby. Okay, you're looking into their eyes. What are your intentions for your relationship with this child? Take care of them. You want to take care of them? You want to love them? You want to provide them with everything they need? You want to surround them with good experiences? And ultimately, you want to establish a loving relationship with this child, both giving love to them and receiving love back to them, right? That is 100% what God did in the Garden of Eden. He created all of these things. In the beginning, he, he made it all. He spoke light into existence. He spoke life into existence. And on the very last day when he created man, after everything good that he had created, he saw man and he said, this is very good. He wanted that loving relationship with mankind. But, well, we're not, we're not even going to get to know him. Um, we'll do that another time. But so... We have this intended will. My intention is to have this loving relationship with my creation. But in order to truly have a loving relationship, you have to give permission, right? So the second will is the permissive will of God. And the permissive will of God is Genesis chapter 2. And the whole point of this is in order for love to be established, you have to honestly be given an option to love something else. And so what did God do? In this garden... He drew a boundary. To love me is to stay outside of this boundary. To love me is to avoid this tree of good and evil. Because if God had not done that, let's think about love and how it's been written for us. Can you truly love something that there's no other alternative to? No, it's like someone holding a gun to your head and saying, hey, do you love me? If you don't, I'll kill you. Like, that's not how it works. God is giving you the permission to make your own decisions. And this is where Lutherans, we kind of get our theology for the whole idea of you can't choose to love God. God created you in loving relationship with him. Your only choice is to choose the sin. That's why it's, it's repent. It's not turn to God, it's turn back to God. You're returning to him. You've already been in loving relationship with him and then we, like an angsty teenager, took off and made our own decisions. We're not all as cool as Ben, who went on a mission trip to Guatemala, okay? We made terrible decisions and did other things. And God is constantly calling us back to him. 
But his permissive will is he's giving us that permission to go and make our bad decisions. How many of you gave your kids the opportunity to make a decision so they could learn from the consequences of their decision? Yeah, I think all good parents do. All right, I remember growing up, my mom, we are recording this one. My mom told me, uh, my mom told me uh, when I was in high school, hey, if you get arrested, I'm not coming to bail you out. All right, I didn't even have to get arrested to learn that lesson. Okay, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't trying to deal with that. And so I didn't get arrested, all right? Every single time I saw the lights behind me, I did not get arrested. It was, it was a blessing there. But you're given the permission to learn the consequences of your actions. And so we're seeing, God is allowing us to see, if you choose something other than me, here's what's going to happen. In Genesis 2 is that example. Because they choose to eat from the tree. And what happens? Consequence. They're aware of their sin. They're aware of their shame. They're aware of their nakedness. But that then leads us to God's ultimate will. That's the third will. And that we see in Genesis 3, primarily Genesis 3.15, where his ultimate will is to get back to his intended will, which is to reestablish a loving relationship with you. And how he does that is by clearing the pathway forward for you. Genesis 3.15, God had already promised, already locked and loaded a solution to the problem of our sinfulness, promising a Savior of Jesus. But along with God's ultimate will, like we talked about today, God is willing to do whatever it takes to bring us back to him. That means not only sending Jesus to pay the price for all of our sins, to cover the multitude of sins that every single one of us have committed, are committing, and will commit, but also he ratchets up the consequences. He slowly, and I said it last week, I said it a little this week, what we're seeing in these three views is God slowly lifting his hand of protection from us so that we can ultimately see the consequence of our actions. So we can see if you choose sin, this is what awaits you. This is the horror that is coming. And so we allow, or God allows, his children to suffer the consequences there. Never without of his reach. Never outside of his reach of grace. He is always coming after us, but he's giving us that permission to go further and further to see this is what it's like without me. But his ultimate will is to clear all pathways back to him. You know, that whole idea of God never gives you more than you can handle. Not actually the accurate translation of that. God will never allow you to be tempted more than you can handle. God always gives you a way back to him. A way to return from that sinful lifestyle you may have gotten sucked into. Whether it's a relationship, somebody who's consistently there loving you, has shared what they think, but is not going to push you. Whether it be a connection with a church body, a connection with a small group, a connection just with a friend. God is constantly clearing the way for you to be able to return back to him because that is his ultimate will that all would be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And so the reason we share that is because these three views of the end that we're looking at are God operating within not only his permissive will, but also, but also his, um, not only his permissive will, but also his ultimate will of clearing all obstacles between you and him, of creating an opportunity for you to see you truly don't want me. This is what that looks like. Okay? And so that's a good thing to kind of keep in your back pocket, keep in the back of your mind, because it helps us to understand why God is operating the way that he is um, within everything that's going on here. Okay? And so... Let's see if this one will be better. That was fun. Testing? That was like half a mile away from my face. All right. Yep. When it gets super loud, you just switch to the quieter mic, right? So... So that's the wills of God. And again, like I said, keep that in your back pocket. Keep that in the back of your mind. Remember this relationship with God and his children, because it's the same relationship we have with our children. We intend to have a loving relationship with them, but we also give them permission to see what it's like outside of us. But even though they've made stupid choices, my daughter was in here, she'd say, we don't say stupid. All right? If we make silly choices that are offensive to God, he has cleared the pathway back home. 
so that we can always ultimately return to him. Prodigal son, prime example, all right? Those are the wills of God. Keep that with you. It'll help express a whole lot of what's going on. But I do want us to look at the 144,000 seals really quick, um, just because we're going to see this number pop up again. Um, and uh, if we remember, within Revelation here, um, we have a code, okay? And one of those codes is, is numbers, okay? And the numerology that we have here, the way we approach this is that the number 144,000 combines two, arguably three, of the numbers that we laid out as a code, okay? But let me just run through the code real quick so we're all on the same page. The number three refers to the triune God, the fullness of God, the completeness of God, okay? Number four refers to the fullness of creation, okay? We want to share the message of the triune God with the fullness of creation to the four corners of the earth. So that's number four when you're seeing that. The number six is one less than God. Okay, does not always refer to demonic things, as we saw in chapters four and five. Um, the six-wing eagles. Okay, that just shows that they are great, mighty beings, but they are not God. Okay, six doesn't need to be demonic, but it can be, because um, Satan will also refer with the six. The number seven, the perfection of God. Yep. Number three plus number four, the triune God plus the fullness of His creation is equal to perfection. It's a beautiful picture, and ultimately where God is leading us to. Then we have the number 10. The number 10 refers to a limited time preordained by God himself. Okay? So the number 10, 10 commandments. What purpose will the 10 commandments have in heaven? None. None. Because there will be no sin. So why do we need the law? The number 10 and multiples of 10 are symbols of God's preordained time, the perfect amount of time necessary for his will to be accomplished. And then we have the number 12, and the number 12 has kind of two meanings. We have it referring to the Old Testament church, the 12 tribes, and the New Testament church, the, the 12 apostles. Okay? So those are the basic numbers that we have, and multiples of those, whether added or multiplied together, or today as we learned, fraction, kind of give us a slightly different view. And so this number 144,000, if you remember, is 12 times 12 times 10 to the third. Okay? So we're getting all of these numbers in here. And you may be like, well, how do you get that equation? Well, we only have these certain numbers to work with that John gave us. And so that's kind of what works out. So this is how we approach it. From the idea of 12 times 12 is 144. If you didn't know that, now you do. All right? Let the Jehovah's Witness number make it make sense to you. Okay? 12 times 12, 144. 10 to the third is 1,000, right? Yeah, that's right. 10 times 10 times 10. If that's not 10 to the third, I'm not sure what that is. But just don't check. Well, you're an engineer. Yeah. Is that right? I think you need to keep the math class on Tuesday nights now. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, yes. The math of Revelation. I, a senior pastor down in Houston used to always joke about, like, science and math you didn't need to know because it's not in Genesis or Exodus. And I'm like, oh, it's in Revelation. So <laughs> now we got to get there. Yeah, Joshua's great. Um, but... Yeah, so 12 times 12 times 10 to the third, that's where we get that. And the whole point of this number, it's combining the 12s, the entirety of the church, plus a multiple of 10, the perfectly ordained amount of time, 10 to the third, as influenced by the triune God. He's drilling it even more so. So what does this number mean in totality? <coughs> the fullness of the church of God that will be saved. Okay? And we're going to see this number again. Because this particular one that we're seeing here in chapter 7 is purposely written describing the Old Testament church. Okay? So although it includes the whole church, it's identifying the Old Testament church. And we see that starting in verse 5 to the bottom where you're seeing these different tribes and where it's from. Okay? And so this I just want to kind of give you a little bit because Liz and I learned it. Because Liz asked an awesome question uh, that I didn't think of. Um, which was... Where is the tribe of Dan? Can you all find it in your, in your Bibles? It's not in there. Did you guys know the tribe of Dan was the tribe of Israel? Yes. Yeah, when she asked me that at first, I was like, I don't understand why that's a question. Um, I had to go look it up. I don't spend as much time with the tribes, so um, that's on me. But the tribe of Dan is not included in here. Why is that? Um, there's some speculation. There's some, I get to use my own big word like Tono did, um, pseudopigraphal. Yeah, deuterocanonical, apocryphal. Yeah, these are the Bible words I learned for this week. 
Um, but th so these terms refer to those, those books in the Apocrypha, the books that the Lutheran Church used to include in their Bibles, but it recently kind of taken out recently, like 30 years ago. But um, they're books that are seen as worthwhile for reading, but not necessarily scriptural. Okay, the Catholic Church maintains them wholeheartedly. Um, again, referring to them in that way, but they keep them in their Bibles. The point of these books is to provide a little more history or context to the books we, we know and have agreed on are, are biblical. Okay, So in those books, it describes Dan as being the tribe that really kind of desecrated the temple. They were apostate in nature. They were the ones who, who really went after idolatry, who really encouraged others to get engaged with it, and overall just kind of ruined everything. Okay. Now, does that mean they were condemned forever? Not necessarily, but that's a thought that, remember, for the first century church, they would have read this list and been like, absolutely, Dan doesn't belong. Okay. Could members of Dan be saved? Absolutely. Just like Germans can be saved. Just like people from England can be saved. Just like Africans can be saved. Like, you can have whatever kind of bias you want towards a group of people. Doesn't mean they can't be saved. Mormons can be saved, should they believe in the true Jesus. And we have some awesome missionaries who are helping them meet him. But all in all, the point of this is, is written to them. They would have totally got it. Yeah, that makes sense. So who replaced him? That's my question for y'all for today. Who replaced Dan in this list? We'll see who knows the tribes today. Yeah. Yeah. Joseph's sons. That's right. And there's actually only one listed, Manasseh. Okay? Manasseh is the grandson of Jacob, and so he's representing another group. Um, again, people regularly assume this. Why Manasseh and not Ephraim? Um, because Ephraim was also assumed to be a bit of a, a wild child. Um, but Manasseh was seen as a good one. So that's, that's what we have in there. Just wanted to point that out in case that ever popped up. That was something that's interesting that came to us. Um, but ultimately, the point of all of this is for us, again, to remember that when we're seeing these numbers in here, the way we approach it, which we'll deal with next week. We'll talk a little bit about the millennial views and hopefully get some back and forth. So if you're someone who doesn't subscribe to our millennialism, please come next week. Um, because we are going to be talking through dispensational premillennialism. Um, and we're, we can only teach what we know about. So it's kind of like, you know, if you were going to try to come tell me about Penn State football history, like, yeah, you can try your best. Um, but if you're telling me something, it's like, that doesn't line up. Like, I'm going to help fill in some blanks. So if you believe it's something else, please come. Because um, we, we want to have that discussion. We want to grow in that. Um, because ultimately, no matter what you believe about Revelation, how you get there, all of us end up in the new heaven and the new earth. By believing in Christ Jesus, that's where we go. And so we, we hold on to that. And the rest of it, we can bicker about until Jesus comes back. And if the rapture happens, we'll happily tell you, you, you told me so. I'll accept that. All right? And if it doesn't, we'll be suffering enough, so I don't need to tell you anything. Okay? Can I pray for us all, especially for the Rodriguez's, and then we'll hop out for the day? Liz, you did a great job. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for today. For, for whatever today was for any of us, Lord, we just we thank you for today. We thank you for your promises of hope and grace and peace and mercy. We thank you for the work you're continuing to do through, through our family, through our community, through our world. We thank you for the opportunity to hear from members of our family who are doing your, your work, who are doing it in, in the world in the sense of outside of the United States, are now doing it back in, in our community, in, in the community of Salt Lake City, in Utah. Serving a, a community where, um, even as they were talking, um, Liz was saying, you know, you, you really can feel the weight of the spiritual warfare that's going on there. Uh, and Lord, I just I thank you that we have people who, who have braved that mission, who are jumping into it, who are bringing your message of salvation to people who, in all honesty, believe they already have. Lord, I just ask you to continue to protect them from whatever may be coming after them, whatever may be trying to trip them up, that you continue to, to, to bless them. Um, we thank you for, for the work. So we thank you for the job that Courtney's been able to have. We thank you for the opportunity that Benjamin got to go to Guatemala. Lord, we just ask you to bless all of them, Megan and Allison too, just the whole family, as they continue to preach your name, to, to show the world the, the power of, of worshiping you. And Lord, to help bring hope and peace to a world so shrouded in darkness. Lord, bless them in all that they're doing. 
and continue to be with us as we dive into this book, as we ponder on this book, as we meditate over this book of Revelation. And Lord, if, if any of us are feeling scared or nervous or confused, Lord, take us where we need to go next. Help us to see um, what we need to see next. And, and Lord, help us ultimately to know with certainty that, that in the end, because of our faith in you, regardless of how scary or, or dark or horrific this world may get, Lord, in the end, you win. And by believing in you, so do we. So, Lord, keep us firm in our faith. May we fix our eyes on you and continue to share your message of hope and salvation with the rest of the world. It's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Amen.